You are listening to the Fancy Free Podcast, where my guests and I share our most embarrassing, funny stories so that we all feel less alone in our imperfections and forge connection through vulnerability and humor. I'm Joanne Jarrett, and I'm your host. And today I have with me, you guys, this is so exciting, one of my fashion and manufacturing mentors, Lana Hoag. Lana is a sewn product supply chain guru. She's passionate about ethical manufacturing, both local and offshore, where her language skills are needed in Cantonese and Spanish. Lana has worked as an employee or consultant to hundreds of companies, many whose names you would recognize, from startups to $15 billion in sales. She teaches and consults on ethical apparel manufacturing through www.garmentindustry411.com. And I met Lana because I went to a conference that is geared towards new makers, garment designers, and manufacturers, which is what I was at the time. And I attended one of Lana's lectures, and then I was like, I got to have more. She was teaching classes in Oakland at the time I lived in Reno, and I would drive over to Oakland for the day to attend these classes. And I'm telling you, it was worth every bit of time that I spent doing that. Lana, thank you so much for being with me today. Ah, Thank you for having me. This will be a blast. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to brag on you one more minute too. So you guys, I ended up taking these classes from Lana and I learned so much. And it would dovetail perfectly with my other mentor, Jane Hamill, who is more on sort of the marketing aspect. Lana does more the manufacturing aspect, which is a whole bear and enough for somebody to specialize in. The product development and production aspect. And I adore Jane Hamill. She's so valuable in marketing. For me, the classes the two of you teach so far is all I've needed. I mean, obviously, I'm doing a lot of research on my own. And obviously, I still have holes because I'm not a garment manufacturer. I'm not a designer. But I had an idea and it came to fruition with the help of people like you and Jane. I probably turned cartwheels down my hallway when I discovered that Lana was willing to consult for me. I had hired a factory and we had all kinds of delays. And right about then, I moved from Reno, which is a three and a half hour drive from the factory, to Montana. And I was having sort of quality control issues and construction issues and such with my shelfy shop line of loungewear. And I was able to hire Lana as a consultant to go into the factory. And it was totally invaluable. And so, you guys, some of whom are probably sitting comfortably in your shelfies as we speak, have Lana to thank for it. (laughs) Ah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Lana is not just your average pretty face. (laughs) She actually learned Cantonese by interacting with the people in these factories. And then I think she learned Spanish elsewhere in her life, but that comes in handy too. So talk to us a little bit about that. So bonkers. How did that even happen? I'm glad you asked. I I did learn Cantonese from working with sewing factories that didn't speak English. And the the sewing factories now that are still around today mostly speak English. But back in the 80s, the factories here in San Francisco, most of them did not. So I had 22 sewing factories to visit every day. And I only had three that spoke any English. And I would ask them how to say something. And then I would write it down phonetically how it sounded. Till pretty soon I had a pretty rich vocabulary, at least... In the garment industry, I know colors and machines and fabric types. So yeah, my Cantonese is is fluent in a sewing factory, but I can't even order food in a restaurant. I like to say that I learned Spanish the hard way. I was married to a Latino for 10 years. (laughs) (laughs) Harder than it should have been, eh? (laughs) Both of my sons identify Latino, and so I spoke purely Spanish to them until they were about five or six years old. So both of my sons are bilingual. That is awesome. What a big gift you gave them. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And they like to date Latinas. So it's impressive to their parents. Oh, right. Get some points. I love that. Oh my gosh. How cute. Okay. Fill in the blanks. What did I miss about who you are and what you do? You mentioned your sons. How old are they? Oh, my sons are grown. One is 27. The other is 31. And they are a blast. They are my best friends. Mm. We all love to dance and we do a lot of sports together. So we're going skiing on Thursday together. And whenever they're over, we always laugh and joke and dance a lot. My sons grew up in a household where it was push the furniture back when a good song came on. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So they live near you. They do. One of my, my younger son lives with me and my older son lives in San Francisco, but I spend a lot of time with both of them. Oh, that's awesome. If you choose to live close to your family, it does speak volumes, I think, about how you were raised. I don't think there's anywhere I could go on the planet. They wouldn't follow me. <laughs> I love it. I could move, but they they won't go far away from me. <laughs> They'll stay here. I love it. That's so cute. My oldest son is a firefighter and he just bought a motorcycle this summer. And I've always had a motorcycle since I was a teenager. So now we get to ride together, which is fun. He's got a fancier bike than I do. So someday I'm going to have to get a nicer bike. Ah, he's showing mom up. <laughs> he's showing mom up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to know you a little better with your rapid fire questions. If you had 24 hours in your home alone with no pressing to do's, what would you do? Oh my gosh, when my kids were little, I would hyperventilate about exactly that. And I would say, oh, I'm going to paint the house and I'm going to landscape the yard and I need to have all these projects. Now, honestly, because we've been quarantined for a long time, what I did with months on end of being on house arrest was to turn all my classes into on-demand online classes. But now that that project's done, I'm actually spending hours doing something I haven't gotten to do since I was a teenager. And that is so. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. I'm so excited for you because sewing is food to my soul, but it is something that I don't prioritize just because life is busy. So I'm so happy for exactly. you that you get to do that. Yeah. I'm remembering more and more things that I know about you as we go. So you've got to tell the listeners how you ended up working in the garment industry because I think, didn't you start out as a designer? I started sewing when I was eight years old. And by the time I was 12, I think I was sewing all of my own clothes and all of my sister's clothes. Uh, I would sew all summer so that when we went back to school in the fall, we had new clothes to wear. By the time I was 14, I was sewing and repairing and started doing tailoring for other people, mostly my mother's friends and neighbors. So when I started into college and I majored in fashion design, I started doing tailoring for men and they would pay me well, but tailoring is a lot of work. It's very labor intensive. And I was quite immersed in the gay community in Portland because the men I was sewing for were mostly from the gay community. And I got smart my last two years of college, and I put myself through college sewing for drag queens who would pay me quite well to make them outfits. And they were so enthusiastic about it. Aww. And sewing for drag queens is about the equivalent. It's maybe slightly better than sewing Halloween costumes, so it's not nearly as much work as tailoring. Oh, right. I'll tell my girls sometimes, you know, when they're sewing, okay, honey, we only need to make this like costume quality versus right. garment quality. So my 17 year old daughter had her first boyfriend last year and they're not together anymore. And I told her, honey, the next boyfriend, could you please find somebody who's fun to feed? <laughs> because he wasn't, he was not fun to feed. And I, I have a feeling that I enjoy feeding people like you probably enjoyed sewing for those drag queens. It's like something you love to do anyway. And then they're enthusiastic about it. And there's like this positive feedback, enthusiasm, and it's so fun. Oh my God. It was so fun because when I finished an outfit, part of the whole process was I would get dressed up and I would go present it to a room of squealing queens that were so enthusiastic. And then they appreciated what I had on. So I always had to do something really fashion forward, you know, black lip liner or some craziness I always did to go drop off the outfit. So that was always a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. So fun. What is your favorite thing about the place that you live? Oh, I live in Oakland, which is awesome because it's such a great diverse mix of people. And especially now under quarantine, my neighborhood is a perfect microcosm of what Oakland is. I have a very diverse neighborhood, not only ethnically diverse, but age diverse. Like I think mm. the youngest member is two years old and I have one neighbor that's in her 90s and we all get together. We, we have a very cohesive neighborhood. In fact, I live on a cul-de-sac down here at the end of the cul-de-sac. I teach a workout class twice a week. 
You are kidding. No, out on the street. That's awesome. It's so fun. It feels social, but we're not in each other's space. And it, it's a great way to like stay in shape because all the gyms are closed. We did something really fun for Halloween. We strung up a movie screen and showed um, a movie for Halloween. We saw Coco. Oh, even the elderly came out in costume. Everyone came out for the kids in costume. That was a blast. Oh, that is amazing. You know what? Actually, I don't know if you remember, but I've actually been to your house, not when you were home. The, the other thing that Lana did for me, you guys, is when I got to a point where I thought I was pretty close to product development being finished and ready to find a factory and start manufacturing, I needed a professional eye to look over the patterns and make sure I wasn't shooting myself in the foot as far as construction being super inefficient, et cetera. So I purchased a consultation with Lana. So anyway, when I was in Oakland one time, I dropped off some of my samples at her house. I love that little cul-de-sac you live on. but And I noticed something. Did I hear water running? Is there a creek nearby? Or there is. I live right on the edge of Sossel Creek. Well, unfortunately, if you just drop something by, what you didn't get to enjoy was my backyard. Oh, I bet it's fabulous. It's so lush right there. Coming from a person who grew up in Reno where it's sagebrush unless you plant it and water the heck out of it. I love the lushness. There's Sossel Creek, which has huge old growth trees. That's not part of my backyard. When I bought my home, my backyard was concreted over and I chopped it up and kept about a third of it concrete and tiled that with Spanish tile. And now I have a wall of bougainvillea growing and I transplanted. Now, mind you, I did it myself. I transplanted a palm tree into my backyard. <laughs> You did it yourself? I'm so impressed. <laughs> a full-grown palm tree. It has a 10-foot trunk. And the, a homeowner in Vallejo gave it to me. I found him on Craigslist. It took me and two day laborers, four 10-hour days to dig it up. And I rented a manned crane who pulled it out of the ground and then put it oh. into my backyard. So yes, it was very much a do-it-yourself palm tree project. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So if you happen to be a shutterbug and have a fabulous photograph of your backyard, I'd love to put it in the show notes. I actually use it as my screensaver because it's so gorgeous and calming. I will send it to you. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Have you ever met a celebrity? I have actually, aside from fashion design, I minored in dance in college. So I got to be part of a program that had a lot of celebrity dancers that would come and do master classes. So I got to meet a lot of Alvin Ailey's team and I got to meet Honey Coles and the Copacetics and their team. They're the, they're the tap dancers who were mentors to Gregory Hines and they featured in the Cotton Club. Oh, wow. But aside from that, I got to meet once the one celebrity that I would want to meet, and that was Dave Chappelle. <laughs> really? How in the world did that end up happening? It was so casual. I used to live in the city in San Francisco and I went to Glide and I picked up my girlfriend who is Chinese and she went to church with me one Sunday at Glide. And she was fascinated by the racial aspect. And so we had conversations all day about race relations. And it's funny, I use Dave Chappelle's humor as an illustration of some of the painfully true points on race. And I had spent all day with her chatting and shopping. And when it's time to take her home, it was in the afternoon, went to cross the street. And there was a fellow coming out of a tea shop, and this was over in the Fillmore. No, not the Fillmore, over Church Street. And it looked a whole lot like Dave Chappelle. So at about 10 or 12 feet away from him, I cocked my head to the left and kind of looked at him, trying to figure out if that was really him. And he turned around and he looked at me and he cocked his head to the right. <laughs> <laughs> Cute. <laughs> And I knew it was him. And I just reached out my hand and said, hi, Dave, I'm Lana, but I really want you to meet my friend Jane, because I've been talking about you all day with her. And uh, he is so cute. He stopped and chatted with us. And his bodyguard is this huge dude to help people back on the sidewalk so we could have this super casual conversation. Oh, yeah. He didn't even realize what a big star he was. So, so when I told him that I had been talking about him all day with her and he apologized to her and he said, <laughs> I, I'm sorry about that. She goes, well, is your humor really bad? And he goes, I'm defiling this tea as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> And as we 
we just chit chatted for a few minutes. And as we turned to walk away, she said to me, is he really famous? And I said, yeah. She said, should we have gotten a photo? I said, no, it was perfect. Cause it was so casual and not mm-hmm. that super starstruck. I'm fawning all over you. It was really just a conversation. Yeah. It was an awesome moment. And the next day she went to work and got to work before I did and told everyone that she'd met Dave Chappelle and they were just on fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I I met this guy. Lana says he's really famous. His name is uh Dave Chappelle. And they're like, what? He said, I just thought it was another one of your black friends. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's so cute. What is the most amazing thing you've ever won? I have had the worst luck ever. It's why I never go to Reno or Vegas because I never (laughs) win anything. I mean, aside from the wonderful things that you can say you won in life, I got to have children and travel to amazing places, but I've only ever won one thing. (laughs) You're going to die. That makes it easy. (laughs) I used to listen to a classic radio station in Portland and I was in my 20s. I was kind of young to be into classical music. It's not the only style of music I was into. I'll listen to anything. In fact, I listen to a lot of rap and hip hop now. But I called into the station. They were giving away tickets to a harpsichord concert. And they would give it tickets to anyone who could guess who the harpsichordist was. And they said they were local. Well, I happened to know a local harpsichordist. So I called in and they said, well, you're the only person who's called. <laughs> I won tickets to a harpsichord concert. (laughs) That's awesome. Uncontested is the only reason I won. (laughs) As you know, the point of this show is to share our most embarrassing, funny stories so that no matter how put together we usually are or seem to others, we remind the listeners that no one's as perfect as they seem or look. So what have you got for us today? I think I have two really good ones. (laughs) And the first one is the precursor to the story is right out of uh, design school, I started my own swimwear line. So I was actually a swimwear designer. That was my first business. So I was designing swimsuits every day, all day long. I was making patterns. I was selecting fabric. I was working with sample seamstress. But the irony of the whole project was that I was really, really fit and I prided myself in no tan lines. So I would (laughs) go to the nude beaches all the time. So the irony of being a swimwear designer is I rarely wore a swimsuit. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) That's the precursor to the story. So I grew up in Portland and there's a part of Sobeys Island in Portland that's dedicated to nude beach. And every time I had been there with my friends, I don't know if we went in the middle of the week or at odd hours, there had been nobody on the beach but us. A long, long beach too. Seemed like it was a good mile long, maybe longer. And nobody would be on the beach. So when my friend said, hey, it's supposed to be hot on Thursday. Come meet us out at the nude beach. I said, sure. I went to a job interview out in that area that day. And after the job interview, I pulled up to where I had met my friends before thinking again that we would be the only people on the beach. And there's tons of cars everywhere. And I thought, oh, this is going to make it harder for me to find my friends. So I know what I'll do. I'll park at the beginning of the beach. And then I'll just walk the length of the beach looking for my friends. And as I began to walk on the beach, I began to take clothes off because I had my interview clothes off and just stuff them in my bag. In about 20, 30 steps, I was completely naked and walking down the beach and focused on taking my clothes off and looking for my friends. And I have always worn glasses. I didn't have my glasses on. And I'm just straining to look at people's faces. Do I recognize their face? Do I recognize their face? And I keep walking. And I must have walked a mile of beach and came to the end where it's not saltwater beach. It's a freshwater beach. So there was this whole shrub growing from up at the road all the way into the water that ended the beach. And there were two guys sitting on the log and they looked at me and they smiled and they said, bet you're looking for the nude beach. (laughs) (laughs) I walked a mile of crowded beach, just absolutely (laughs) butt naked looking for my friend. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Oh, to have been a fly on the wall. Well, there were no walls, but you know what I mean. 
Well, it turns out the nude beach was on the other side of the hedge. Oh. My friends thought it was great. They go, only you wouldn't notice that you're the only naked person on the beach. It didn't <laughs> seem to faze me, though. But I hung out with a group of friends that like to go to the nude beaches. So we had been going to that particular nude beach on Sabi's Island for a long time. And they one day said, we got to go to a new place. We found this new place. And they said, it's a little bit further to drive. It's a beautiful river and it's very isolated and it's got a train bridge and all this stuff. It sounded great. So I get in the car. We're in the car over an hour, like hot and sweaty, all stuffed in this little car. And I said, this better be a nice place. We get there and it's packed with people and it's not nude. Uh And I was like, I was annoyed because I didn't want to get tan lines. I'd managed to have an all over tan. So I said, I tell you what, I'm not getting back in the car to drive somewhere else. I could see up the river where the bushes and the trees began to overgrow the river that it was a little bit harder to get to and harder to see. I said, we'll just walk up the river a little bit and be out of eyesight of everybody else. And we'll have our own little stretch of the river to enjoy. So we did that. And we walked up the river and we made our own little nude beach up the river where people could kind of see if maybe if they had binoculars, but they'd really have to strain. So it wasn't a big deal. After bronzing my front and bronzing my back, I started to get hot and I wanted to get in the water. But where we were up river wasn't a swimming hole anymore. It was kind of more like rapids. It was hard over the rocks. So I thought, well, I'll just go stand in the water a little bit and splash it on me. So I went and I stood in the water and then I tried to squat down and sit in the water and get more of it on me. And the current picked me up. (laughs) And began bouncing me down these rocks right into this middle of the swimming hole where everybody was. It was a hot, crowded day. Beer drinkers, people jumping off the train bridge. I could tell that I had caused a bit of a stir. The water was dark, so they couldn't really see. But they had known that I'd come from up the river. So they knew that I was nude. So I kind of waited till all of the chit chat died down and... The water is really cold. It's like melted ice. Ugh. And I thought, I can't stay in here forever. And there's no way to swim back up the river. Eventually, I'm going to have to get out of the swimming hole in front of all these people. And I'm naked. <laughs> so I thought, what's the best way to do this? Well, the one thing I was determined not to do was that I have to throw a knee up and like clamor, right? I wasn't, <laughs> that, that would be really That's bad naked. not graceful. So I thought, <laughs> At least if I am going to get out of this water, I'm going to get out of the most graceful way possible. How can I do that? And there was a part of the swimming hole where the wall was really high and a part where the wall was low and more like steps. But where it was low and more like steps was where there was more people. But I thought that's still going to be a lot more graceful than being on display trying to clamber up this wall. Like... (laughs) When I when I was like pink from cold, I finally swam over to the low end and started to like gracefully lift myself up onto the steps and out of the water. They really were almost like little natural steps into the water. They were covered with algae and they were slippery. Oh. And I started to slip and there was a teenage boy sitting there. I must have been about 19, 20. I think he was about 12 or 13 and he was sitting right where I was trying to walk up. And when he saw me slip, he reached out his hand and I grabbed onto his hand and I still exited the water very gracefully. But when that teenage boy grabbed my hand to help me out, he looked me right in the face and he said, you're beautiful. (laughs) That was the best day of his life. (laughs) I think I burned an image in his head that probably lasted forever. Unfortunately, most of the women on this earth probably can't live up to that image of Lana perfectly tan at 19 years old and fit and nude, <laughs> glistening with water. <laughs> Grabbing him by the hand. <laughs> you simultaneously thrilled him and ruined him. <laughs> but I was able to exit the water very gracefully. And when I got back to my friends, they're shaking their heads. They were the same friends who had been on the other side. They're like, oh, jeez, what did she do now? (laughs) These are the kinds of things that people have dreams that they're waking up in. Oh, totally. Well, you little nudist. I went to a nude beach one time in Greece, and I'm not a world traveler, but I have been to Greece, and I believe it was in Glyfada, which is a 
beach resort town near Athens. And I don't even know because I was 11 years old. But I was interested in the no tan line thing too, but I didn't go onto the actual nude beach. All I had the nerve to do was go behind my little hut thing where we were staying and bring my top down so that I was topless, but I was all alone in this yard and I was still like mortified. (laughs) (laughs) Afraid you might be found. Yeah, exactly. Somebody's going to see me. When you go to the nude beaches, some of them in Europe, they're more therapeutic yes. for geriatric women to kind of go soak their tired oh. legs. <laughs> huh. There's not a lot of eye candy necessarily. No. <laughs> I did go to a semi-nude beach in Italy near Venice called Lido de Hezolo. It's topless. I mean, I suppose you could go all the way nude, but I don't remember seeing anyone all the way nude. There was a lot of topless women. So I took my top off and I felt really comfortable like in our little group and being on the beach and coming in and out of the water. But they have these snack shacks that you can go to. And I'm not particularly chesty, but something about standing with a counter <gasps> pie while I'm ordering my food, I just, I couldn't do it. I had to put my top on to go order food. Isn't that funny? That's hilarious. Well, I have to tell you, I don't know that I could have a conversation about nachos or French fries topless. And it was probably another teenage boy, right? You could have, you could have thrilled him. That and I didn't want to stand there and wait for my order. (laughs) (laughs) That's awkward naked. Do you have a life hack for the listeners? My best life hack, and this is something that I've always known I've needed because I've always exercised and I've always eaten well. And happy is a choice. So those things I know contribute to my health and health is your greatest wealth. But I have to say that there was one aspect of that that was always omitted until over the last two years. I actually get a full eight hours sleep every night. It's amazing what it does for your health. I knew this intellectually before, but never, you know, when you're a single mom, I didn't have the luxury of doing that. But if you ever get the luxury to treat yourself right, even do it a couple of days in a row, eight hours sleep a night is amazing. And not the catch up sleep that you try to get on the weekends when you're grinding yourself down during the week, but actually take a couple of nights and just go to bed early. That is so true. And Easier said than done. I'm a lot more able to take on stress and not mm-hmm. have it overwhelm me. I'm just much calmer about it. Um, the other That's life awesome. hack that I, that you and I had discussed earlier is I've been about six years now without eating sugar, no refined sugar. And wow. I had gotten to a point where I, I felt inflamed, but I didn't know what was causing it. And when I stopped eating sugar, it was amazing. That is the most amazing thing. It, it took away a lot of the inflammation. So no sugar and a full night's sleep has done amazing things for my health and my well-being. It's tangible how I feel. Wow. I feel, feel much more in control of my life rather than my emotions controlling me. I feel like mm-hmm. I'm feel much calmer. What is one surprising thing about you that nobody would be able to tell just by looking? I think probably the thing that surprises people the most is that I speak Spanish and Chinese. And I would say that it even surprises sometimes Chinese people. They'll be talking and then I enter in the conversation and ask questions and stuff. And they always look a bit surprised. Like, oh my gosh, she's tracking with us. Or, and then sometimes they'll start talking to me really fast. Like I understand yeah. everything, which I don't. My Chinese is semi-fluent. My Spanish is fluent. I learned Spanish like you learned Chinese, not garment factory Spanish, but OBGYN postpartum Spanish. Ah, yes. <laughs> so okay. I can say is the bleeding from your vagina or a lot or a little in Spanish, but I can't say much more. I would find my really nice labor and delivery bilingual patients. And then I would go through my postpartum questions. You'd have to make rounds in the morning and there's not necessarily a translator. You have to get this information. Right. So I would ask them to tell me how to ask certain things. And then I would write them down phonetically and pretty soon I had it. But then they, the answers are, are loose cannons. It's like, yeah. I have no clue whether it's like, no, I need a yes or no answer or a here, here, or here, you know. Really good point. Yeah. I speak quite a bit of Chinese in a sewing factory, but outside of that, like I said, I can't order at a restaurant. So that's probably the most surprising thing when people see me because I'm 
just this little blonde lady. I would say the other thing that tends to surprise people is the motorcycle. And I also skateboard. Really? I never stopped skateboarding. I skateboarded on a team as a teenager and I just never stopped through when my kids were little and I still skateboard. Uh, That is amazing. Oh my gosh. So do you go to a skate park or do you just skateboard around your neighborhood or what do you do? Now I look for smooth surfaces. Like I go up to the tennis courts and just skate around. But as a teenager, we used to skate half pipes. When my kids were little, we would go to the skate park and I would still skate the half pipes. I haven't skated a half pipe in a long time now. There used to be one actually when I worked at Beta Brand. There was a skate park over there by Cesar Chavez and Petrero. We would go over there and we'd have skate lunch and we would bring our skateboards and we would go over to that skate park and skate around. But I still, I'm 58 and I still skateboard. That's, see, now that is the number one most surprising thing about you to me is your age, because I would have guessed that we were very similar in age and you're full. Did you say you're 58? 58. Crazy. So you're 10 years older than I am. You don't look a day older. And I know it's your healthy living and your amazing genetics. Uh, Don't hurt, hurt, I'm sure. Tell my listeners a little bit more about your online seminars and your new online community Level Up. Ah, after about 15 years in the garment industry, I was working on a program that was sponsored by the Department of Labor and housed out of City College in San Francisco, where I was asked to lead up some topics that I had familiarity with and develop curriculum. Over a 15-year period, that one class, which was quality assurance, a great part of my background was quality assurance. I began to break out other parts of my experience and teach classes. So over a 15 year period, I developed these six classes that I would teach one a month for six months and they they would repeat twice a year. And those are the classes that you went to. Yep. I did five out of the six of them. Then I had to move away before the sixth one. So I'm going to take it online. I can't wait. (laughs) I don't even remember what the topic is, but that doesn't matter to me. (laughs) They're available all now as on-demand videos. And I would have to say that the content is even better because just like this podcast, I've edited and edited and added in examples. So you have a lot of visual examples. I've edited all of the forms so that they were flawless and they're built around a fictitious business. All of that is available online. There are 10 things that I sell online. Most of them have videos that go with it. The video might be 30 minutes or it might be four 30-minute videos. Anyone, no matter how busy, can usually find 30 minutes at some point in their day to invest in their business. Totally. I think there's only a couple of things that I sell that don't have a accompanying video. I sell a list of pre-vetted, registered in California garment contractors, sewing factories. So there's a couple of things that are available that don't have a video, but there are 10 items available. If you were to buy them individually, it would be $850. But if you buy the whole set, it's 552 So you get an incredible discount. And there's even more if you've already taken the classes with me, but you want to have the set of videos, I offer mm-hmm. even an additional discount to that. Yeah, awesome. I have my notebooks, of course, of all of the notes that I took from your classes. But there was so much density of knowledge and concept that having those videos would be invaluable. I Ideally, I would watch one two or three times or, you know, just pausing it, you probably wouldn't have to, but having the video that you could go back and refer to, such a good tool. I could tell that I had given a lot of information in three hours. I'd like packed it in and it's hard to absorb all of that until you are able to practically apply it. So, so you might watch a video go to work on it and then come back and say, now, what was that she said about? And then you'll have the video available to you. So they're all available now on garmentindustry411.com. Oh, that's so amazing. Some brands start making product and then realizing that they have inconsistent fit from product to product when that really is something you address right up front. So how do you go about knowing what your fit should be and what those measurements should be and making sure that all of your products fit the same? That kind of information is in the videos. The difference between me and some of the other people that I've seen as educators in the industry is because I was a single mom and could never afford to leave my day job. I've always taught these classes as a side gig. So all of the information that I've shared over the years, 
I've seen practically in the companies that I've worked for, and I've had 17 day jobs, so 17 different companies I've worked for, every range and size of company and different types of products. I've made men's, women's, children's, lingerie, outerwear. I think the only product that I have not ever actually made in production is real fur, like fur coats. For every type of product imaginable, and I've applied what I teach in my classes, including the forms, in those businesses and fine-tuned them so that I know they work. Yep. It's so practical. There's nothing that isn't useful. It is completely, it's completely incredible. I mean, my sister was like, I cannot believe you're driving to the Bay Area to go to a class. And I'm like, I have to, I can't get this anywhere else. I'm so glad. You did come by far though. I have to say you didn't come the farthest. I used to have someone fly up. She was a pilot and she would fly up from LA once a month. Oh, that's awesome. And I had another person would fly over from Hawaii once a month. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised because the garment industry is really interesting. And before I delved into it, I wouldn't have necessarily understood the significance of the fact that it's not like you can just Google stuff and find the factories and know the language. There's a very private and almost secretive aspect to it that if you're not an insider or you're not in the industry, and I still, I've just scratched the surface, I know but that you just can't access. I think you really hit the nail on the head. It's very secretive. It's very underground. And that coupled with being highly regulated and very competitive and price sensitive, the challenge is knowing where you can cut corners and where you absolutely can't. And that is the key to success and to making a profit. That's what my classes are good for. Focusing you in on what to pay attention to and what you can let go. Yeah, absolutely. I think the next time I watch them, I'll probably get a whole new set of knowledge just because now I've actually been through a lot of the things that you've talked about and I'm going to hear it with a different ear. So I'm, I'm excited yeah, to do that. you've done your undergrad now. You're ready to get your math. That's right. <laughs> Collection number two, here we come. Oh my gosh, Lana, you were so much fun. Thank you so, so much for spending time with me today. Tell, tell the listeners one more time what your website address is. My website is garmentindustry411.com. Thank you, Joanne. And I am thrilled to that, that Shelfies has just finished its first production. I can't wait till people see them. They are so practical for working at home. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. The, I don't, I really don't think that they would have materialized without you. <laughs> and, and I so appreciate all of your wisdom and help. Well, and the other really, really pleasant surprise to me, and I think your listeners should know this, is um, you were so generous to give me some samples. They fit amazing. Yay! That's so good. Fit. No weird fit issues. They all look super cute. They hit me in all the right places. I really love the way they fit. So, Oh my gosh, that's huge. Yeah. How wonderful. Awesome. Huge, especially after your first production run to not have any weird fit issues is so uncommon. I've been doing this a long time and most companies have something they have to shore up afterwards, but I never get to bring home something from the store that I don't have to fix. I've got it on. I can wear it. Wow. That is incredible. I'm so excited to hear that. Okay, you guys, if you thought that was fun, I cannot wait for you to hear Lana's crazy date story. I wanted so badly to put it in this episode, but it just was getting too long and it is so good. I can't even believe I'm saving it, but I am. At the beginning of season five, after a three-week break, the last two weeks of June and the first week of July, on July 12th, Fancy Free will open its season five with a crazy, bad, and funny dates compilation episode. And Lana's date is, I think, my favorite I've ever heard of. I laughed so hard. And I just can't wait to share it with you guys. But anyway, Lana was awesome. So much fun. And if you have a design in mind and and it's a sewn product and you just don't know quite how to get it off the ground and all of the practical logistics, I highly recommend Lana's classes. And I will link to her website where you can get her classes in the show notes. Make sure to check out today's show notes at fancyfreepodcast.com slash episode 96 so that you can get all the links we talked about today. 
Next week on the show, I have Emily Siegel, and she has such fun stories about making new friends as an adult. She's so hilarious. Remember to subscribe to the show so that new episodes pop into your feed each week. Our regular episodes come out every Monday morning, but I very often put a special extra episode out on Wednesday or Thursday, and you don't want to miss that. Now, the other thing that I recommend if you have a sewn product that you're trying to conceive of producing and selling is Jane Hamill. She is an amazing marketing teacher, and you might remember her from episode 93 of the Fancy Free Podcast. She's another one of my mentors. And I was just on her show too. Her podcast is the Jane Hamill Podcast. And the episode that we did together on her show is called The Kickstarter That Kicked My Butt and How I Saved It with Joanne Jarrett. And this gives you a really in-depth step-by-step process of how I went from idea conception to inventory and all the crazy things in between that happened with Shelfie Shop. We get into the nitty gritty on that show. So if you're interested in that, I would highly recommend listening to that and then becoming one of Jane's clients as well. Between Jane and Lana, you pretty much get what you need. If you have a story to tell, email me at notfancy at fancyfreepodcast.com or go to fancyfreepodcast.com, click the red button record a voice memo story, I'll clean it up, and then you will be featured on listener stories. If you want more connection, laughter, and sharing, join the Fancy Free Facebook group. The question of the week this week, of course, is have you ever gone to a nude beach? I would love it if you would tell at least one friend about the show. That is the best way to spread the joy. Have a wonderful week, and remember, no one is as fancy as they look. (laughs) 